Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Matthew chapter 6, reading from the New King James Version. And here's what Jesus said. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Oh, do we do this even in subtle ways? We can just say, well, that was my idea or uh, that was me who did it and try to be nonchalant, play it off. But still, we made it known that we did this or that of a good deed for somebody. And Jesus said, if you do it for that reason, to get the credit from people, to get the esteem from people, then you have no reward from the Father in heaven. Well, I don't want that. I'd rather the reward from the Father. But notice this, verse 2, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. So apparently, this is what people would do back then. they sound a little trumpet because they wanted everybody to know, hey, I'm about to do some charitable deed. And Jesus said, oh, that, they're hypocrites. They're, they're acting like, they're presenting it like, they're doing this from the heart for the person, but really this whole act is staged to do something for them, to get credibility from people. So he said, don't be like the hypocrites who do that in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. In other words, the little bit of glory they get from people, Jesus said, that's all they're going to get. Verse 3, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus, don't even let your, you know, the other parts of your own life know about it. Don't even uh, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, say nothing to anybody. Just do it because it's the right thing to do and because it's love. So he said, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed, watch this, may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. In other words, really what he's talking about is the motives of the heart. Just do it because it's the right thing to do, and that's it. And don't make any fuss about it. Don't make any uh, promotion about it in any way, even subtle hints. That your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Don't you love God? Oh, God rewards people who have the right motives, not just do the right things, but do it for the right reasons. And so he goes on to say in verse 5, and when you pray, I love this, when you pray, not if you pray, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So notice here, Jesus is saying, if you're going to pray and you're really coming to God, depending on God to do something, then stop trying to do it in front of people so that you look spiritual to them. Jesus said, no, go to where it's only the Father listening to you. Now, Jesus is not saying, of course, don't ever pray in front of people because Jesus himself prayed in front of people. But he's saying, don't do it for that reason. He's saying, if I could just elaborate a bit on what Jesus is saying, he's saying, don't make your primary prayer time only when people are listening. Most of our prayer should be happening when no one's listening but God. Because that is showing the true motives of our hearts that we really believe God is the one that's going to respond. And we're not trying to get anything from people. Oh, Jesus addresses the heart. And so he goes on to say uh, that the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. 
And this is true in a variety of religions and uh, denominations and such where they'll encourage a repetition of certain prayers, thinking that if they say it over and over and over, and uh, Jesus, in essence, is saying, God's not hard of hearing. He doesn't need you to repeat what you were saying. It's not so much how many words you can say, but do you believe what you're praying? Or is your heart right while you're praying? Verse 8, therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. He doesn't even need to hear you say it once to know. Now, do you need to still pray it? We do. And Jesus says to pray it when you pray. But we don't need to keep repeating it as if God is hard of hearing. And so he said, the Father knows, your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Ask him, in this manner, therefore, pray. And of course, here's the famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer. He said, in this manner, therefore, pray. He's teaching us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I believe that this is not a prayer that we're just supposed to repeat every day or often. I believe he's also giving us something of a format of prayer, starting off with our Father in heaven. Notice not my Father, our Father. Sometimes we get so individualistic, independent from one another, instead of realizing, wait, we're all part of the family of God. I can't come as if I'm the only child of God. Our Father in heaven And then notice this, hallowed be your name. First of all, I should acknowledge who you are, that you're the holy creator of heaven and earth. Holy, hallowed, holy is your name. And then your kingdom come. Notice before I start asking God to do something that I want him to do, I need to acknowledge that his agenda is higher and more important by far than my agenda. What's on his mind is more important than what's on my mind. So Jesus said, say this, your kingdom come and your will be done. So before we start praying what we want, let's come and say, God, what do you want? Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we can begin to ask, give us this day our daily bread. Notice Jesus says, pray to God. He's your provider. And we'll get to some more of that in this chapter. Uh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to not go through prayer without confessing any sins that have not been repented of. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation. I believe we need to be praying this, Lord, lead me around temptation. Lead me far away from temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notice Jesus is saying, end by saying, Lord, with all of this, yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory forever. Lord, all of this comes back to you, your kingdom, your power, your glory forever. Amen. And so Jesus is giving us something of a format to pray, not so much a prayer that just needs to be prayed verbatim, on a regular basis. Verse 14, and by the way, I've used this format and and still use it so often, I'll, I'll just feel led to walk through this. And of course, it comes out with many more words of praise and thanksgiving and, and petition as well. Verse 14, for if you forgive, notice Jesus picks up after the prayer and focuses on one particular point, forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in uh, in neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Jesus just, I mean, puts it out there to say, by the way, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. By the way, we we've sinned against God far more than anybody sinned against us. I don't care how bad people have sinned against us, it cannot compare to how much we've sinned against God. And so the debt that we owe to God is much greater than even someone who did horrific things. And by the way, there are people who have experienced that, and God's sensitive to that. But God still wants us to forgive. That doesn't mean we trust them. That doesn't mean we even like them. But 
we do need to forgive so that God will forgive us. Verse 16, moreover, when you fast, notice before he said when you pray, now he's saying when you fast. So in other words, the lifestyle of a believer is to pray and also to fast. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Oh, look at how we are as human beings, always trying to uh, have somebody to see us. Oh, that's very carnal, it's very immature, but nonetheless, we human beings tend to be like that, some more than others, of course. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Jesus said, you're not getting any more reward for your fasting than that. You made it known to people, there's your reward. Don't expect anything from God. Boy, that's a, what a waste of a fast. He goes on to say in verse 17, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret re will reward you openly. So Jesus is, is saying, don't, go, don't let people know. Don't even do anything that would give a hint that you're fasting. Now, of course, if somebody says, are you fasting? Do you want to go to lunch? Oh, no, no, thank you. Are you fasting? Well, he's not saying to lie about it or to make a big deal about it because sometimes we can bring more attention to ourselves by the way we uh, try to hide the fact that we're fast. Oh, no, it's, no, it's okay, it's okay. You know, it ends up bringing more attention. It's okay to answer somebody and say, yes, I am. But Jesus is saying, don't intentionally hint or make that known. Verse 19, do not, here we go, we're going to start talking about financial things. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is addressing something. We feel so much more mature, uh, secure here on earth if we'll put... Uh, a nest egg away, savings away, retirement away, and such. And, and I don't think Jesus is saying that's bad to have any retirement or any savings. But Jesus is saying we tend to think the more we can stock up in some account somewhere for the future, the more secure we are. And Jesus is telling us you should put it in a more secure place than here on earth. You should do the things that God is telling you to do, to give as God is telling you to give, and to minister to complete your assignment because then you're uh, gaining rewards in heaven where they will really last. They won't last here on earth. They're vulnerable to the, the economy. They're vulnerable to people stealing, et cetera, et cetera. He said, but the ones, the rewards in heaven, those are the ones that will last. He said, you should focus more on those. And so he goes on to say, in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is that you're most proud of, your heart will be there. Notice he didn't say wherever your heart is, that's where you'll put your treasure. He said wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will follow. So we need to keep our treasures in heaven that we're most excited about, and our heart will be there also. Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now think about this. You think about a projector, like you go to a theater to watch a movie, and in the back, glaring through a window, is a projector, and it projects that movie onto a big screen. Well, Jesus is saying your eye is a projector. But instead of projecting out, your eye projects into your heart, into your soul, into your spirit. Your eye projects inward whatever is out there. So in other words, if I allow my eye to look at something that is perverse, sensual, sexual, wrong, then what I'm doing is by allowing my eye to look there, I'm projecting that right inside. Uh, it, it projects those images, projects those, um, those thoughts, those perspectives right into my soul. And so Jesus is saying the lamp of the body, and think about a projector lamp, the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your whole body inside 
will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, if your eye looks at wrong things, watches movies that are inappropriate, sexual, sensual things, inappropriate, pornography, inappropriate, or just looking at people and checking them out in the wrong way. He's saying if your eye is not doing the right thing, you are projecting right into your mind, right into your heart, right into your soul. You're projecting that right into yourself. You don't realize. You think it's just out there. It's no longer out there. You use your eye to slam it inside of your heart. And what's going to happen? You're going to have to deal with it because you projected those things inside. So he said, if the light that is in you, the eye is the lamp or the light of the inside of your body, your soul, your spirit, your mind and such. If, you're, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If you're projecting darkness in you, how great is that darkness? Why? Because now the darkness is on the inside. Now all those things that were out there, now you brought them right inside. This is why we need to be so careful what our eyes look at and see and, and ask God to help you to discipline your eyes, not to look. I mean, uh, you know, we drive around and we'll even see signs of whatever gentlemen's clubs or whatever and such. Boy, I tell you what the Lord has taught me. Don't look. Don't look. And curiosity will just say, no, I'm just going to glance and see what it is. I'm not interested, in, but I'm just going to see what it is. And the Lord said, no, don't even look. Don't even look. Just keep your eyes away from that. Like Proverbs says in 425, I think, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. God shows us how to protect our heart. Don't let your eyes go because you slam it right into your heart. So just keep, keep your eyes from looking at that stuff. Don't let curiosity control your eyes. You pay attention to what Jesus said and what the Bible teaches us. Keep your eyes away from those things. Because if you don't look at them, it won't come in. But if you look at them, you project it right in. Powerful little truth right there. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Notice he doesn't say you should not. He said you cannot. You cannot serve two masters. And he ends up saying you can't serve God and mammon, the, the money, the God of money, because this world is ruled by money. And verse 23, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. In other words, think about the most important things. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So Jesus said, look, the birds are not farmers. They don't sow any seed in the ground. They don't reap any crops up to eat. And he said they don't gather into barns to you know, stock up and prepare for the future. And yet your father feeds them every day. And he said, don't you know you're of more value than they are? What is he saying? He's saying you think you have to go through all this system. And of course, farmers do need to sow and we do need to gather and have these crops. But Jesus is saying you get so focused on the process that you forget the God who created that process, the God who loves you, the God that will feed you. And so he said you're of so much more value than the birds. If he feeds the birds of the world, billions and billions of them every day, certainly God will take care of you if you'll look to him. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So he's, he's really addressing worrying about money and things. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They don't make clothes, the lilies of the field. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He said, with all of Solomon's outfits, with all of his wardrobe as a king, the wealthiest king that ever lived, he said, Solomon's whole wardrobe could not compare to the beauty and elegance of one lily that God clothes. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? The lily is just a beautiful, beautiful flower. Now watch this. He goes on to say uh, in verse 30, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. So Jesus is addressing something. He's saying, you have a God who will clothe you. 
He'll give you food. He'll give you drink. He'll give you clothing. He'll give you all the supplies that you need. Why are you worrying? Just look to Him. Look to Him and place your priorities where His priorities are. And so He goes on to say, Therefore, do not worry, verse 31, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, and we could equate that today to unbelievers, this is what the whole world is chasing, is more wealth, more money, more clothing, food, uh, retirement, and such. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Jesus doesn't say, you don't need those things. You don't need clothing. You don't need food. (laughs) Yes, we do. He said, your heavenly Father knows that you need those things. Watch this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Notice, he, he doesn't even say only seek the kingdom of God. No, he said seek first. See, it's not just seeking the kingdom of God among other things. No, Jesus said, no, the kingdom must be first. That's why when we get paid, we should tithe first. Why? Because God first. We put God first in our lives. See? And he said, if you'll do that, if you'll put God first in your lives, then all these things that the Gentiles are dying to get, striving to get, they'll be added to you. (laughs) They'll be added. You don't have to chase them down. God will add them to you. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jesus is not saying not to plan ahead. He's saying, but don't worry because your father will take care of you today. And guess what? He'll take care of you tomorrow too. What a powerful passage. We could spend hours on this passage, but it's good to just read through it and let the Holy Spirit speak a few things to us.